Hi, I wanted to make an announcement. We're actually going to be selling merch. I have the first merch shirt. We're going to modify a bit of the designs on the front so things fit a little better. As you can see, it's a little long, but we want to make it a little wider. Bring this out a little and um, clean it up a little for you. We have some logos on the back. I am happy with that. I think it looks great. And honestly, I'm excited that we have this merch available. Anything that we have ordered will come back partly to the podcast. We're gonna be using that to help fund our project. Any support helps and, and we really appreciate you guys joining us every episode. Make sure to rate the episode, comment, share it along. We're really looking to expand our horizons on what we're doing here. And honestly, I, I can't wait to travel into some new subjects like philosophy. I really hope you enjoy and from the bottom of my heart, I, I appreciate you guys being here. It's a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Yeah, they are massive. There goes Cameron off his desk. They're Mastodon. <laughs> I cracked myself up, so that's all that matters. <laughs> okay, look at Benjamin right now. Tell me that's not a man ready to answer his Dude, he's animal. Um, <laughs> Dude. He's got it. He's like, I know, I know. He might be frozen. He <laughs> might be frozen to the most awkward stare ever. <laughs> How long can you keep that stare? <laughs> so he drops down. Oh, so that's going to be the first short. That was hilarious. <laughs> ben, what happened? Uh, they they all said, "Oh, Ben's leaving. I'm out." Wait, Dude, yeah, I can't well, believe I can't believe my computer froze. I was like, "No!" Way. We're gonna we're gonna move in with this discussion today, and we got some exciting questions for you. We're gonna start out with, "Where should modern day philosophy go?" Is there truly a differentiating factor between ancient and modern philosophies when it comes to the present? Um, philosophy, to me, is, and from my understanding, is usually something that is foundational thinking that it is being expanded on. You know, we all understand core concepts, but philosophical thinking is the expansion of our thought processes beyond those foundational concepts. And so it, it's always seemed to me that it's kind of a building block process. And, you know, the first philosophers and, and some of the major philosophers throughout the last 2000 years that we recognize, you know, Aristotle, um, you know, recognize even like Newton and people as philosophers. And we, we see their ideas and you see you know, Marcus Aurelius, you see all these different concepts emerge. And a lot of the time they're just based on each other and how each person has interacted with someone else's perspective of philosophy. Uh, you see a lot of Greek and Roman philosophers will base uh, a very large amount of their philosophies on the same principles and because they were based in the same you know, geographical region, the same location. To me, philosophy is always a building block style where you know you build the foundation out and then you have to add different blocks on. Sometimes the blocks don't fit. So you have to figure out, okay, I've got like Tetris blocks. Sometimes I have the L and sometimes I have a, a rhombus and sometimes I have all these different shapes. And I have to see where they best fit in with each other. And that's so philosophy to me, I don't think you ever abolish a philosophy. I think you just determine a certain avenue of thought isn't essential to your philosophical ideas. Absolutely. Um, what I like there, Cactus, is, is it's that concept of building blocks there. 
that you mentioned, which is that I don't. That you can't abolish a philosophy. Because how do you stop people from thinking about a specific subject? You can never truly lock down and controls how someone is thinking and interfacing with the world. And over time, perhaps it could, you know, fizzle out or be lost up other, you know, ways of thinking, but it is something that is built up over time. It's a, it's a culmination of individuals contributing their experiences that are observed through a desired lens. There are core foundations, as you said, that people try to build off of, that, that they try to apply to their lives. But each person attempting to apply it is going to be in a different position, different experiences. And through that, the sharing of those experiences, it's going to build on and on and on. And maybe oh, there's a specific metaphor using a boat that I can't remember off the top of my head but it's the, uh, you replace the planks. Is it the same boat as the, as the planks rot out and decay and you build new ones? You, you, you know the metaphor that I'm going for. The ship, the ship of, not Theseus, the ship of, oh, I, I know what ship you're talking about. I can't remember what the name is, but yes, um, the ship that each piece has been replaced so many times with different materials and different materials and everything else and the pieces of different ships and you've replaced so many pieces that, you know, the entire ship has technically been replaced. Is it still the same ship that you've repaired? That's, exactly. uh, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Thank you. I, I was, I was going to ask, it was like, would you mind being able to pull up the actual name of it? Um, cause I, I was that, actually right. It is the ship of Theseus. Hey, there you go. Second but guess with myself. that concept is you have like I'm I use stoicism simply because that's a certain school that I enjoy studying and that's something that I think a lot about. It's you have all these past, you know, philosophers who are building off their own understanding of the philosophy. And it is transformed through time. This is, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago. Where we are now. Stoicism gave way to cognitive behavioral therapy. Is it the same philosophy if it builds off of that core attributes, but it's not called Stoicism? Or is the Sto or someone who calls themselves a Stoic or who says they study Stoicism, but it's taken on a completely different turn, is that still, you know, Stoic practice? So it's you can't really nail down what is going to happen to a philosophy because it's always going to be changing. It's always going to be morphing and adapting to people's interpretations and interactions of their environment. Yeah, that's actually a really great counter and a really great use of the ship of Theseus as a reference uh, in terms of if you if you break a concept down, or you know, if in this in this term, if you break something down to the verbiage, you know, and you do the exact same thing fundamentally, are you are you not follow, following the rules of stoicism, or you know, it's like it's that weird line of mutual exclusivity that sometimes is almost fabricated. We, you know, we create that divide that doesn't need to happen because. You know, you're being a stoic, but as you said, you're also representing different values or, you know, we're calling it now cognitive behavioral therapy, even though it's, you're representing the same values, it's under a different label and representing different ideas, but under the same, the same philosophy. And that really relates back to how we said that the philosophies can't really, you know, can't really be killed off, can't really die. They're just expanded on or changed. So if I may, I uh, actually wanted to interject with a, a bit of an odd point. It's It has to do with Warhammer 40K. I actually enjoy that series. I know Benjamin and, and Aquatic are familiar as well. There's a lot of deep lore when it comes to 40K. And the lore that I was recently um, studying was the Leagues of Votan. And the whole premise behind their origin 
um, that was recently wrote is actually really, really interesting. I didn't understand at first uh, quite the depth that they went to, um, but the story has a lot of AI references that tie into how the society functions. And what I find interesting about that from a philosophical stance is so quick breakdown every much like um, the space marines if you're familiar they're basically all related but in a different sense they're clones that was something I didn't realize but the, the space dwarfs that they set up in the series are clones of each other um, and when they die they're uploaded to their, their organic memories are uploaded to this hardware that they treat as like a multi-generational grandfather so to speak the, the ancestral uh you know keeper and the thing is after thousands of years of this data and thousands of deaths all this data is accumulated there's no like there's such a lag that would, for the simplest pro problems because there's so many opinions and and things it has to sort through information and, and I, I thought that was a very interesting premise because this whole society is built around this driving force of knowledge but they weren't able to take that knowledge over the years and adapt it to their own uh way of life so to speak they, they formed their way of life around that source of knowledge rather than participating and forming their own um and i, I think it, it's funny because it ties into this question to a degree where I, I think to have a successful philosophy it has to be in the present it has to be able to be in the present and live in the present um, that doesn't mean that you can't take points and, and observations from that, but it, it seems to me like it, the philosophy is much more than just text. It's, it's a, in some cases, a, a way of life, much like a spiritual journey or walk or faith. And, you know, not in all cases. You can, you can have basic philosophy uh, for philosophical principles, but it, you have to have those modern pioneers that are breaking it down to the modern situation in a way that's understanding of the principles. And especially when it comes to uh, the accountability, you know, making sure you're not becoming something that you strive not to be. Like, it's very important to have that targeted focus and, and, and ensure that you're headed in a direction that's not pulling people into a bad or, or worse mindset. Actually, Cam, that connection that you made with the League of Votan, that really kind of just brought in a, a thought of mine, which is... As you find a philosophy that really kind of, be it a religion, a philosophy, or just any sort of way of thinking, you know, if it's something that dra that draws you in, and it's going to draw on multiple different people, what I find interesting is that your experiences are just as valid as the people who came from the past, because it is those individuals' culmination and wisdom. With the AI models in the League of Votan is you have such a huge, massive database that is thousands, hundreds of years old of a culmination of all these different experiences. But, there, but you mentioned that there's that lag. There's no dying off of the old knowledge from hundreds of years ago. Because let's say that, the, the, you know, let's use an example here from that. Let's say that the League of Otan, a specific colony, came into contact with an alien race. Now they, and there was a huge conflict from that. The remains, the organic remains and memories, which were put into the computer, now have that database. What if that alien race is now long, long gone? 
and then that information is still brought in where someone says, oh, hey, but what about this? We had this experience in the past. Yes, but how long ago was that? How has the universe and societies changed? And I think that that's kind of the, the advent of our line of reason, of kind of that separation from technology, more so perhaps towards books. Exactly, yeah, that, uh, what Cactus just put in the chat. Um, it's with what with the with just re philosophy itself what i love is that we have these old references but there have been a culmination of more and more things that have been adding on and over time there's going to be certain ways and understandings that are going to fade off to the sands of time it's just going to fade away because as we the newer generations bring in our own understandings and interactions you have your own validation your own experiences but you have to be aware that there are people who are older and have more experiences than you whose experiences are just as valid as yours are yeah absolutely and and i think that's why that that uh really struck me because th this is something that they know is going to get worse and inevitably it's going to fail but they it, it, and that's, that's similar with a lot of systems right now like consumerism feels like a system that's bound to fail i think most of us feel that way um at, at least in the modern vision you know the, the modern uh, efforts that are put forth it's it's collectively not producing enough positives to validate our mass quantity of production. I mean, at what point does a tradition no longer overcome its shortcomings? Yeah, yeah exactly. When, uh, when do you stop doing something for the sake of, of, oh, well, we've always done this. And it's a, a fallacy I've caught a lot in my professional careers. Uh, when I was working in the oil field and things like that. I would often question their methods. I don't think the way that most people think. So I, I have a bit of an abstract way of doing things. So question simple things. I'm like, why do you take the measurement this way as opposed to perhaps just taking this measurement and multiplying it over this number of times? Because you know you have this number of flower of uh, uh, phalanges that you need to cover, so you need to have a certain number of, of caps that you need to make in a certain way. And they, they kind of just look at me and be like, well, we've always done it this way. I'm like, well, you've always done it that way. It doesn't mean there's not a better way to do it. You, you just assumed that the person you would learned from knew best, and there's absolutely never been a way to improve it. And because you assumed that this is the best way and there's never been a way to improve it, you guys aren't thinking about ways to improve it. You're not thinking about breaking the system down and going, well, what if we didn't have this? What if we didn't have this at all? How would we solve this problem? Would we use the same solution? Would we come up with something else? Is there a different solution? And that issue of like that level of, of thought is missing a lot of the time, which is oh, we've always done this, you know? So where do you break away from the wisdom of the past and understand when in, you need to shift towards the focus of the future? <clears throat> I have two perfect examples for this right now. Um, one being I'm learning how to drive a forklift. Uh, as someone who enjoys driving, like trying to drive actively forwards and reverse, all the time if you know what i mean is is uh, very very jolting and trying to uh get used to that and actively you know stay in my limits because i i um it, it still feels very new and and you know it feels like oh it, what if i make that mistake uh, what if I'm actively working with that and I, I mess up, I break something? Like, uh, I I feel like I always need someone there, right? Uh, it feels natural to have a team, but sometimes you have to take that independent leap and and broaden your skills, push your comfort zone to finally feel comfortable being independent um, in that form. 
and that's that's very tough you know and um this is the second point I, I actually uh, forgot right when I mentioned it. I hate to say. So <laughs> we'll move forward. So good. I actually wanted to jump back for a moment um, in response to what Benjamin was saying earlier about how relevant old information is. And that actually offers us a bit of insight into one of the paradoxes of faster than light travel or even interstellar communications when we start to become an interstellar society, since that does seem to be a push of humanity. Um, that being said, one of the main paradoxes with faster than light travel and faster than light communication is how relevant the information is. Um, without faster than light communication, but faster than light travel, you will never be able to accurately communicate between systems. The reason being is if you're a hundred light years away, your information takes a hundred years to travel by radio transmission. So you need a way to get that information to them instantly. It's not like your video transmission is going to be better. Um, after a certain amount of time, you get massive amounts of lag. And you know, when you're talking about hundreds of years, you it's okay, we need you to send help from our uh, closest pod resource planet, and we're about to get pelted by an asteroid system. You, The pod resource planet sends out an expedition party, some of their only resources, and the pod resource now gets stranded because Earth isn't there when they get back to it. And you start to end up with this weird cycle of, oh, we're under attack from this planet. Oh, okay, we'll send ships to help. Oh, we're actually, we've settled and there's a peace treaty, but now that your, your uh, support platoon goes and attacks and you're at war again, because they didn't hear about the treaty. And then after they hear, oh, we're not at war anymore, we signed a treaty, but you've already restarted the war and now they're attacking you again. And you're like, well, what the hell? We, started, we signed a peace treaty. And there's this massive game of, of interstellar telephone that is always lagging behind until you have fast light communication or and I think fast as light communication. With that is, especially then that gets into the concept of power and uh, infrastructure. Because I feel like now, if you look at empires of the past, you have... Um, one you can always go to is uh, the Roman Empire. When you have a single centralized what's, source... What's of, the Roman Empire? Uh, when, when, when were they uh, around? That's a great question. I believe it had something to do with lizards. Um, oh, oh the, well, that's when the lizard people first first came to Earth, was the Roman yes, Empire? Yes, 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 yes. And they, they started roaming the Earth, and that's why it's the Roman, the Roman Empire. I see. I got you. <laughs> Cameron's is over here like, you guys, guys, come on. I don't know, I have enough ADHD for that. <laughs> yeah. But to focus in, to, to hone in on that, is when you have that centralized point of power, because, I mean, let's be honest, when, when you think about empires, it's one specific nation, then by creating multiple... Vassals. Uh, Vassals, thank you, Cameron. Um, when you create vassals, you create representatives for a des designated area that's feeding information back to one place. If you have, if you as a vassal are being invaded by a, another power, and you need, you desperately need the support of a larger military force, you have to relay that all the way back. You have to get authorization. There has to be supply trains that are sent out. And which is there you have what uh, Cactus said, where if a treaty is signed that you don't know about and you just go out and start attacking someone because you were told they're the enemy, that is going to just stagger it up. Or the army can get there, reach the governing city of the vassal state, and it's destroyed. It's been sieged and no one is left. And I find that particularly interesting where now you have, we see that in corporations where you have HR departments, but you have one governing top power source that is directing typically the path of the gov the path of the company. As that spreads out, how is that going to then affect the people on the lower, lower rings? How's it spread out? It's, it's, re it's reach of power. 
Yeah, exactly. How does the distribution, uh, how does the distribution actually distribute power within the system? And uh, I think it was before we went live when Matthew was saying the the distribution of power in a group of 25 people is that um, they find that typically it's five people that 50% of the work for eight people five or eight people came from the statistic they mentioned that uh, 50% of the workload ends up falling on. And I found that that was an interesting uh, distribution. But as you were saying, it's, it's when you think about the corporate divide of, you know, what the CEO's vision of the company is versus how that gets diluted and distributed throughout the company. And it is a very dividing uh, division or divisive system that they've put in place, but we're never addressing how divisive that is and how that creates holes in communication, which we know for a fact are essential because, you know, the people at the top want all of the information so they can make effective decisions. They can lead or command effectively and they can't do that without all the information. But as their message gets diluted and watered down throughout the spreading, they're losing massive amounts of communication. Yeah, everything comes at a price. When it comes to that, I mean, it's like I was pointing to in our last episode with the culinary um, distribution. Like, it's without the distribution, uh, it's a lot of culinary hubs, like Las Vegas being a giant one. Uh, the, the seafood, say goodbye, you're in the desert. It's. Anyone you know, trying to sell you fresh fish in the desert is, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, a little fishy, to say the least. That's why I sell it. So it's something to keep in mind with how, especially fish fishing, uh, is changing over the years. I think that that's the that can that we loop into tradition of. At what point is that sustainable? What point is that maximizing the outcome per effort being put in? Which is, you if you have that tradition where you're like, this is the one goal we have, this is the one, you know, route we're trying to go down here, that doesn't allow for a lot of specialization. That doesn't allow for a lot of diversity in one specific power. And if you have a far reaching power structure that is set on that one mind, that one path, that's just going to spell disaster for multitude of different areas that it's, uh, it controls. Yeah. Well worded, honestly, I think, um, Honestly, if there's a point you want to bring up for the next question, I'm I'm ready when you guys are. Yeah, um, that was a well faceted, or it says a well a well put point. Just that you need to be multifaceted. That you can't be, uh, can't be one one direction focused. You can't just be single minded. Otherwise, you you lose perspective. Because the best way I can put this is perspective is about seeing the whole picture and when you have your hands covering your vision like this you're not seeing a lot of the picture you're limited your tunnel vision is the term that a lot of people will use because you can only focus on what's directly in front of you you have to put effort in to look around and acknowledge what's around you but even then you're not acknowledging what's behind you what's around you what's above you when you're just focused on the thing directly in front of you so that limiting factor is always the issue. If you're if you're hyper focused on one specific goal, you forget about secondary goals and their importance, or perhaps their necessary their necessity for the structure of the main goal. Yeah, yeah, it's all about the building blocks. Absolutely. I noticed that you had put in the chat here, what inspiring individuals have helped shape your very actions? Does not have to be someone well-known 
for me, I think this, uh, I actually really like that because that for me breaks down very much of how I socialize and how I kind of conduct myself um, in my social circles, which is that for me, inspiring individuals, it, it's not like a soul person that I could really kind of put it on. There's some that I might be able to pick out, but for me at least, pretty much almost everybody in my life has an inspiring aspect to them. And not in the sense of like, oh, they've done such wonderful and tremendous things of they have found the cure to cancer, they've, you know, mastered or they've mastered a philosophy. It's that each individual person that I've interacted with has had such different experiences and lessons that you know just from them talking about it i gain insight and perspective i have my own you know idols such as marcus aurelius or the only one i could pull out of my head at the moment i have a couple of them everyone has their own virtues and everybody has their own not fascinations but they have their own skills and when talking and sharing with people, I gain such great insight from them that I try to then apply to my own life. And it's, I, I love everyone that I've, that I consider a friend and family and they've all taught me such wonderful things. There's value in what you said with finding value in everyone. Like, and just kind of uh, having that balance of where to look and where to build relationships um it's very easy to forget that it's it's hard to learn you know it takes time to learn uh, to form those habits so taking a step back and understanding that there's other people that you can interact with this is it plays to your strengths uh, in most cases even if it's a tough environment like I've, I've exposed myself to certain teams where I don't feel like I'm the most capable member on that team um, by any means. And, you know, I, I still come out a, a little better from coming in because I had that exposure. I understand, okay, well, maybe this team was a little disorganized. So now I know how to work with a little more disorganized team um, or maybe instill something that I need to study to help better my chances of making that disorganized team organized. Uh, and that's really the challenge. To, and that's where a lot of people find success in the workforce is they provide those solutions, able to interject. And, and as another part of uh, what I was reading, or sorry, listening to um, earlier today with the podcast, talking about how companies really rely on those hard facts from their customer base, you know, it's, it's essential that you understand the, the base that you're working with because it's, it's easy to lose sight of, of why you need to be specific and accurate and quality with the work you do. Yeah, no, as well said. Um, Thank you. I'm trying to gather my thoughts here, but in response to your question, it's a bit of a difficult one for me. I've always looked to a lot of different sources for information. I've always sought a complete perspective. I have looked for different philosophers. You know, I've looked at the lifestyles of Gandhi. I've looked at conquerors and you know Buddhists and pacifist monks. And I, there's a lot of different philosophies that really are, are great guiding points in life, but as I said before, I often think that the cumulative knowledge of the past is meant for us to embrace, but also to challenge. We, we should accept what has been learned before us, but we should sometimes take the lens of an observer that assumes that they knew nothing that then the information that we had in the past was wrong. And it's things like non-Newtonian physics that uh, I'll relate this to your other question. What's a topic you know very minimal about yet you wish to further explore? 
um, the exploration of quantum physics and non-Newtonian physics, we are discovering that there are instances that physics doesn't behave the way we think it should. And that's giving birth to more and more emerging ideas in quantum physics where we have to explain these anomalies. And it's, if we had not spent two to 300 years assuming that people like Newton were right, that were just absolutely right, that they had the whole picture figured out, we could have been making these advancements sooner and challenging ideas probably that would be pushing us into space exploration and multi-star system travel. But instead, we spent a lot of human... So this is an ADHD rabbit hole. I'm going to loop this back. We spent a lot of human hours, which I'm going to use as a metric. 8 billion people times one hour is 8 billion hours. So if you say a human hour, I'm talking about the, like, the metric amount of time that says 8 billion humans amass this amount of time spent in one hour. Um, so in a human hour, the amount of time that we wasted, the amount of human hours wasted over hundreds of years compounded is astronomical and it blows my mind. So the more human knowledge that we possess, the faster we can distribute that knowledge to more humans, the more effective every human hour becomes. That should be the goal of our species in my mind. The more effective every human hour becomes, the better we are at providing food, education, transport, uh, in interstellar travel, knowledge, ability to challenge knowledge. The, the more that we're able to put these tools in the hands of our species, the better we will be. And that comes from, this is where we're going to pull it all together, looking at all of the information sources you're exposed to and seeking out new information sources constantly to challenge the ideas of the people before you, of yourself, of the people around you. Your experience is an ever-changing thing, and you can't type form it into, ah, oh, well, an apple hit Newton on the head, so that explains the whole universe. Like, that, it's such a limited, simplistic mindset, and we need to move past that. Yeah, I can agree on multiple levels of that. I think that's very, very well put, Cactus. Absolutely. Well, as they say, sorry, knowledge it's a little power. long winded. Yes. No. Absolutely. And I think that that's kind of where we're where we're really branching into with the way in which technology is going. Is that every individual has a essentially a computer in their pocket that is connected yep. to a massive database that can be used. Then what comes in, though, is what is that device actually going to be used for? Because there are, I can't say the amount of times that I've thought to myself, like, oh, I wonder about this thing and this thing. And then there are times where I'm like, you know what? I have to remind myself that I have Google and I have Wikipedia. I have this device I can use to educate myself in this moment. Or exactly. other times then it just gets lost and I'm like, oh, I'm going to play Flappy Bird. Yeah. Um, one of our other members, uh, Dan, actually, Dan Kearns, actually had a really good point about that is, you know, we all have, we, a lot of us have access to the same tools. You know, how I use a pencil versus how you use a pencil might be different. So the, the manufacturing process that goes into it is just as important as the end use and what the user chooses to to do and to create or to to purpose that tool for 100 percent. well with that being said is there uh, another question we want to bring on to the board um do, 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 do. i can just keep going down the list if you want i have a couple things written in my notes chat over here yeah yeah i guess uh the only other thing i would, could quickly add to uh 
seal off the point for myself is uh, I would love to study like microbiology, at least uh, understand a little bit more about it. Um, it's something I've always really enjoyed. Nice. That's actually a, a great focus and uh, something that I think offers a lot of potential benefits to, to society. Understanding how we work on a, on a macro scale has been a focus for a long time. And I think we still need to focus on how we work on a micro scale before we can truly try and focus on the macrocosm. Uh, I totally agree. Yeah, between that and agriculture, it's important. For me, I think if there's one that I could try to improve myself on is the influence and fears of social interaction. I think that's one that I've always had kind of like the psychology of understanding and identity. I think that's probably one that I could really, really delve into is, you know, for me to call myself, you know, Benjamin and add on a bunch of different identifying factors of like a man, uh, of a Californian resident, a citizen of the United States. If I, with all these different spheres, how does this then affect my psyche? What do I gain from these identifiers and these um these words and concepts that I apply to myself and kind of break down the deeper understanding of how might I be able to find myself a more holistic connection with those around me. That's interesting. And it just kind of brought a weird visualization to my head is that, especially when you kind of mentioned the different spheres that you're in, it got me thinking about your self identification is kind of that center sphere. You know, it's it's that it's going to be that small dot right in the middle that aligns with all the overlapping circles that make up your personality. You know, your geographical location, your social interactions, your mentors, your teachers, your access to information, all those different spheres and different circles. And, you know, your self identity truly is intermingled with all of those things, but it's who you believe yourself to be and who you wish yourself to be is that central dot. And socializing is kind of how your circles mix with everybody else's. It's just, a, it was a weird visualization in my head. With that said, I believe Cactus, you have another question for us. Would you like to choose uh, our next question to get into? Yeah, actually, it relates really well to the one that Benjamin suggested here. Um, and it's, what's the next big focus of human advancement? You know, and I talked about human hours and allocating the amount of time into better projects. What, what would be uh, some things that you guys think would be reasonable projects for humanity to really... To, to, if we could come together on one thing, what would you want it to be? For me, resource sharing. I think the, this not separation, but the ability to convey the, the need, it's a com okay, it's a combination of advancement, the need for resources and fitting with geographical um, locations. The one thing that comes to my mind is if you look at South Africa compared to the rest of Africa, the kind of uh, civil civilization lifestyle um, structure in South Africa, bringing a, a lot of European um, kind of mentalities and understanding to that area, or at least as far as like infrastructure building and stuff is it's not suitable to that environment. South Africa said that they had a huge drought, yet it was not mentioned to the rest of Africa, whether or not they were experiencing that. And so it's part of that needing to communicate and share, Hey, you know, this land is here, but we can't 
keep applying this style of living to this specific environment. This is going to create more issues than it is going to be able to solve problems. How might we be able to communicate here on the West Coast more effectively what we might need from the East Coast and vice versa? Being able to move around communication barriers and cultural differences and being able to go in and share, we need this to survive, but how can we do it more effectively? Very long-winded way of saying, how do we talk better? Yeah, yeah, better, better communication, I think, is a great avenue for how we start to distribute resources better and it's always been crazy to me it's the tribal mentality though you have power if you hold all the berry bushes and another tribe needs berries otherwise they're all going to get scurvy you know you you hold power over life and death and that's a i think for a lot of people almost too much of an intoxicating uh, ability that's something that a lot of people shouldn't have and yet uh, tribes sought it out because it meant that they were guaranteed to survive in times of uncertainty and i i could be crazy for thinking this i you can point your finger and laugh at me all you want but my hot take two thousand five hundred years away from when we were really doing hunter gatherer type things I think maybe we can say that we're, you know, times are a little bit more certain. We, we know how to source food. We know how to transport food. We know how to distribute resources. We know what our neighbors are. We know all the edges of the globe. We know what all the corners of the map look like. You know, we have a lot more knowledge now. I would like to say that maybe that level of uncertainty is gone and that we can stop relying on the knowledge of our hunter-gatherer tribe mindset and grow and move it on as a species and understand that we're better now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I definitely think uh, you're on to a great point with it. It's not apparent what direction necessarily leads us to the best decisions, but communication and setting aside the ego is definitely a, a big portion of that yeah absolutely it's uh pride and ego are are a big issue i too i believe as well it's uh barriers to communication so you know part of communication is uh dissolving barriers to communication yeah yeah truly that's a discussion on its own that's not a can of worms i'm about to go down right now yeah yeah no uh actually um about ready to head to our closing after a few questions had answered. I'm thinking if you wanted to touch back on this point you had in here, or just scroll back up, how do we reach a standard of living for every human being? What is that standard? I thought that was a really good question, actually. Oh, um, that was a good question. Yeah, I, I wanted to touch on that. I, I think... First off, we, we reach a standard by having that communication, at least on the local level. You can't ever, we've kind of dis deciphered on past uh, episodes that it's hard to have that mass communication democratically equal. And I, I mean, inevitably impossible because there's so many factors. With how the system runs, it's highly, highly unlikely that your individual opinion is going to be reflected in the politics you see on screen. You know, it's and, and what you don't see on screen is is the part that's tricky. You know, it's, you you don't really know if if your your vote counts, so to speak. And that's that's not just a, an American struggle. I think there's a lot of countries that struggle with knowing the true credibility of of their country. You know, of their their national identity through their government like that's that's a big deal and being able to have a standard of trust with your government is i think a big part of having finding that that 
middle ground that's that's uh, suitable for your populace. Um, there's obviously a lot of factors there, but it starts with with uniting people under or for a purpose. You know, right now uh, there's a lot of people that feel society's going in a, a more negative direction. Dare I say? And uh, at least with the youth, because developments have uh, been pushed. Like there's there's a lot more tech at younger ages, and and that that has pros and cons. But a lot of it is is the attention span. It's hard for people to identify with longer form content and and things like that. We're seeing that reflected in in YouTube stats and and various uh, media implementations out there. So even in the classroom as well, I might have just for teachers, you know, they're when I was a kid, it was teachers were losing their minds trying to get kids off their cell phones, but it's difficult because you're taking one of their a major tool from these kids now because that that phone is baked into their life so but because it's it's the multifaceted aspect it's the social device it's the the calculator it's the clock it's the computer it's all those things you're only trying to take away that the privatized communication the same as passing notes in class right that's just the evolution of it and now teachers are having such a hard time keeping kids on task because they still have their phones now it's a violation of their privacy to take their phone and blah 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 so it's like they they just have a constant distraction in what used to be a 90 minute block or a 75 minute block or a 60 minute block of uninterrupted learning Uh, now you just that uninterrupted learning aspect doesn't exist anymore and that's it's the education system hasn't caught up. Yeah, and, and to truly have a, a, a good standard for your people, it, you have to have education. Education is also a very important structural component to all this. Yeah, education is certainly important. I, I value every bit of education I've had in my life, whether it be personal or, or done through you know, the medium of a teacher. It's it's always been a positive experience learning something you know sometimes there are negative emotions but the actual learning experience itself has always been the positive that i can draw from a negative experience certainly i think that that is uh, you mentioned the lag between the system and technology and i think that's kind of what we're really going to i think these these next coming five years or so, I think are going to be fundamental in really kind of defining the reaches of technology, not in the sense of like where we can't go, but more in the sense of how far are we going to go before we realize like we need to stop. And I think that as you mentioned, it's the tradition is starting to clash with the advancement and change. Are you going to clamp down on the advancements being made in their interaction with everyday people? Or are you going to accept that there's some things that you are just not going to be able to truly break, you know, lock down in on control and you change with it? Yeah, yeah. Where do those social barriers get broken? At least challenged. Absolutely. Yeah, again, I think that would be a a discussion for another day because the whole breakdown of when do you let the social norm dictate the flow versus when do you create the flow around social norm and change the social norm? That's a... It's an interesting discussion and an interesting thing to think about, and I think uh, one I would certainly need quite some time to think about as... I, my brain's already flowing, and I'm just thinking the the social dynamic itself is already difficult. But then, how, when do you decide, and how do you decide for all of humanity, or or for your group of humanity, or your your section, that this is the best outcome, and that you know this this should be the deciding outcome, or the consequences are too great? It's just it's a whole bag of worms of the social system itself, and. We're, I think we're a little bit too 
disconnected as a society to truly find a solution for that problem uh, today, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And like you mentioned, I uh, think we'll have to come back to this. Um, yeah. Because it's definitely an interesting talk, uh, social structure. So a little different than, than just, you know, wealth or finance. Like there's, there's real organic dynamics there. But um, again, an, another time in the near future. <laughs> With that said, I really think that we've come across some great topics today and I'm sure these two will agree that it's been a blast and we appreciate if you made it this far and and joining us today with this intellectual adventure and I do hope that you guys are able to join us for the next episode with that if you guys would like we'll time it perfectly this time all right thank you for joining us on and, and the intellectual, intellectual adventure. adventure. We'll take it. We'll sure. take it. Works for me. Works for me. Yep, yep, works <laughs> for me. Thank you, folks. Have a great day. Take care, everybody. Day.